So good afternoon. I'm uh, Mary Beth Shannon with the California Healthcare Foundation. Uh, foundation has two offices. I'm from the Oakland office, which is our main office, and then we have a wonderful Sacramento office where uh, Sandra Shuri and Katie Rodriguez and Danny Sandoval are based. Um, and so we do these briefings periodically. I think we have a couple of more that are scheduled for the fall. I don't have dates for those yet, um, but if you're on an email list, you'll get notification of those. Um, today's topic, which is making information avail available on outpatient surgery in California, um, is one that we've been interested in for a couple of years, and this report actually took a couple of years to actually get done uh, because we continually found new information, and I think Brenda did a fabulous job of unwinding a really, really complex topic. So you have a copy of both an issue brief and the full report. Uh, the full report is the one that's bound. The issue brief is in your packet, um, which you can spend a lot more time to get the details. What we hope to do today is prevent present kind of a broad overview of the topic, some of the issues that we've identified. Um, and so uh, Betsy uh, Imholtz is going to start us off with a discussion of kind of the consumer perspective about ambulatory surgery centers. Brenda then will then go through a lot of details about the report. And then we've invited um, uh, two groups to respond um, to kind of what they've heard and, and what they think the future here holds. Um, so we have Yvonne Chung from the California Medical Association um, and Bryce Doherty, who uh, is with, I think, uh, Lynn, I'll, I'll do uh, intros in just a, se just a second, but he's representing the California Ambulatory Surgery Association. So let me just start. Uh, the setting of care issue, this might be a little bit hard to read. What's along the bottom are a number of different um, kind of uh, um, areas where one would have, potentially have surgery that could occur either in an ambulatory environment or inpatient. The blue lines are those that are ambulatory. The red lines that are those that are largely done in an inpatient environment. So you'll see for some kinds of procedures, the first ones are eye and ear and nose, mouth, and pharynx. They're almost 80, 90 percent are done in an outpatient basis. Um, whereas if you get to things like respiratory conditions, cardiovascular, obstetrical, those are almost exclusively done in inpatient settings. Um, but what was a little troubling to us, uh, we do these periodic reports on facts about the California healthcare system that we call the CHCF Healthcare Almanac. And we went to do one about four years ago, five years ago, on ambulatory surgery centers. And we're really troubled that we found what you can see in this chart. Um, these red lines are the number of facilities that were reporting data to OSHPID that we could use to generate this report. And that dramatically fell off between 2007 and 2008, and that was result of a court ruling I think many of you are familiar with, um, but Brenda's going to talk a little bit more about that, the Capon versus Shuri decision. And so after that point, there was much less available through the Office of Statewide Health Planning. Um, the orange, yellowish orange bars that you can see, that's information that we're getting from CMS, which is much um, kind of uh, not as extensive a data set, but at least this gives us some sense of what's occurring um, in freestanding uh, ASCs just in terms of numbers. So we can kind of see the difference between what CMS says is happening in California versus what we're getting through the Auschwitz system. On a regional basis, it's even more dramatic, I think. You'll see in Los Angeles County with those top two bars, um, 283,000 were reported in 2007, and then through Auschwitz in 2010, we could only see 4,897. I'm sure many more than 283,000 were occurring in Los Angeles, but we no longer have access to data about that. Um, so we just really know some raw numbers there. So to just kind of illustrate where this takes us um, and what this means for us, I just looked at two different ambulatory surgery centers that happened to be located in Fremont. And uh, their names were the Fremont Surgery Center and the Surgery Center of Fremont. And I didn't make that up. Those are their actual names. Um, these are the actual pictures of those facilities. And as you can tell, they're you know very impressive looking buildings. I think people would feel comfortable that they're going to get good medical care behind either one. But we really can't find out much information. Um, because I've been investing two years on this subject, um, I actually knew to go look at the medical board site to see if I could find additional information. And I keyed in Surgery Center of Fremont, which is the top circle. Um, what come back, came back was the Fremont Ambulatory Surgery Center, which is yet a third name. So if I were a consumer, I think I would find it very difficult to know whether I found the right place and whether the information that's going to be provided through the medical board site is indeed the correct information. Um, so because I could not find the um, Surgery Center of Fremont, 
I have to assume that that is not one that's um, uh, overseen through the Medical Board of California, but I don't know that for sure. I don't really have any way of looking at a list and finding out who the regulator is for this facility, what the ownership of this facility, and what information I can find out online about the facility. Uh, so that's just kind of an introduction. I'd like to now uh, talk a little or introduce our panel a little bit more. Uh, so Betsy Imholtz is the Special Projects Director of Consumer Union, which is the Policy and Advocacy Division of Consumer Reports. Um, and then next, we're going to have Brenda Klutz. Uh, Brenda Klutz is the managing partner of BNR Consulting LLC, which is a consulting firm specializing in public health policy and regulatory compliance. Um, and then we will have uh, Bryce Dougherty, who leads the healthcare advocacy practice at KP Public Affairs um, and does represent among his clients the California Association, uh, Ambulatory Surgery Association. And Yvonne Chung, who is the senior director for the Center of Medical and Regulatory Policy at the California Medical Association. So we'll start off with Betsy. I'll bring up your slides. Good afternoon. And thank you all for coming out on this hot day. At least you've got a nice, cool place to stay. Um, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, patient safety has been a focal point for Consumers Union and Consumer Reports for many years. As part of our advocacy work uh, in that area, we have a cadre of um, patient safety activists, both here in California and nationally, um, that we work with. And they have either uh, been harmed themselves by a medical error or an infection, or in some cases lost a loved one or a family member. So they're very motivated and dedicated to working on these issues. We prepare them to work on advisory committees, um, testify at hearings, do some lobbying, et cetera. So um, we're particularly focused our, in our patient safety advocacy um, in recent years on reducing hospital-acquired infections and medical errors, improving accountability of doctors, and overall improving the quality and safety of care in all settings. So Mary Beth asked me to just sort of open this up with why is this topic important to consumers? Um, first of all, there's been a huge increase, as she noted, um, in the types of procedures performed and the number of procedures performed in the outpatient setting in California and nationally in recent years. Nationally, there's been a threefold increase in the lower risk procedures like colonoscopies and glaucoma surgeries. Um, and so every consumer now, it's, it's very common for consumers to have experience getting surgical or other care in uh, these outpatient settings. But increasingly, higher risk procedures as well um, are being performed on, on an outpatient basis in outpatient centers, um, including orthopedic surgery, I can attest to that myself, um, heart stents, hysterectomies, back and weight loss surgeries, and certainly cosmetic surgeries. All of these things that are considered higher risk are also now being performed uh, at outpatient surgery centers. Reducing health system costs has become a major priority for policymakers and others, and that has fueled the push, I think, toward outpatient uh, settings. And insurance benefit designs, um, as well, may have lower cost sharing uh, for outpatient treatments, and thus may encourage consumers to opt for or to um, at least readily accept uh, getting the services in that setting. We all seek to get better value from our health insurance, and uh, costs are certainly likely lower in the outpatient world uh, for consumers as well. But the question is, what is the value, what is the quality part of the value equation? How does that turn out? Is the care received at an outpatient surgery center at least as safe as hospital care? Is it safer? Uh, the truth is, we really don't know. And while consumers care about lower cost and they care about the convenience that can result from, for example, being able to be discharged more quickly after a surgery, the most important thing, of course, for people is safety. Uh, the potential benefits um, of lower cost and convenience are really negated if, in fact, there's a greater risk for errors, infections, or other complications that may need, uh, in fact, lead to greater uh, additional care at an acute uh, care hospital. High-profile cases as well have fueled consumer interest in outpatient facilities. Um, certainly the Joan Rivers death at the New York outpatient facility and examples closer to home, lap band surgeries and others that have been in the news have brought this issue um, to the public uh, attention. So the question is, what do we know about the safety of the range of procedures performed at California surgery outpatient settings? How does it compare to hospital performance? And the answer, as you'll hear in much more detail from Brenda and as sort of Mary Beth previewed, is very, very little. 
um, we, we, some folks believe that um, outpatient surgery centers might be pushing the envelope, some of them, maybe doing things, trying to do things more safely than they can really do, or for patients who really shouldn't be seen on an outpatient surgical basis. At the same time, we know that hospital-acquired infections um, are a huge problem, for example, and perhaps outpatient centers have lower infection rates. The, the point is we really do not know because we don't have the data. So why don't we have the data? Um, well, the CAPEN decision is one thing which Brenda will talk more about. But in, a in addition, there's just a patchwork of regulatory structures and agencies charged with overseeing different kinds um, of outpatient surgery centers. And it, in part, it relies on ownership and operating models that are subject to different statutes and regulations. For example, surgeries may be performed in a hospital, outpatient surgery clinic, an off-site clinic that's affiliated or owned by a hospital, or a freestanding outpatient surgery center not affiliated with a hospital. And many of these may be owned by a doctor or a, or a single doctor or a group of doctors. So this patchwork of regulatory actors, and frankly, it's an alphabet soup that has taken um, all of us a couple years to try to even get a handle on, um, make it virtually impossible for consumers uh, as well to figure out uh, who oversees the facility, who owns it. Um, and imagine if you want to file a complaint and you can't even figure out who the right agency is to go to. So for example, those that seek Medicare funds uh, are primarily overseen by the California Department of Public Health. Many others are overseen by the Medical Board of California, which of course also licenses doctors. The Medical Board assumes oversight if it's physician-known or accredited by a board-approved accrediting agency. However, the Medical Board doesn't really fully regulate these centers under its purview as we think, many of us think, of traditional regulation. Instead, the statute under which it operates really delegates a great deal of responsibility and oversight to accreditors. And there are currently five approved accreditors um, by the Medical Board, and they're essentially self-regulatory bodies. Each has its own standards and definitions. And this makes it impossible to get comparable data. And this is why the uh, Mind the Gap insignia is up there to remind you there's just a huge gap in information. It's virtually impossible to get comparable data. This chart, simplified, um, illustrates the problem pretty starkly. Take, for example, the first line is medical errors. Um, several years ago, Senator Elaine Alquist, a great patient safety champion, um, authored a law that required adverse event reporting by hospital and public reporting of, of that. And so the California Department of Public Health does post for each hospital facility adverse events or medical errors, as we often call them. Current state law on outpatient surgery centers, on the other hand, requires facilities under the jurisdiction of the medical board to report events to the board, but the board doesn't make it public and there's no public um, reporting requirement. And furthermore, under the Department of Public Health, that's the Medicare certified facilities primarily, there's no state requirement at all that we've been able to find um, on the books, a state requirement that is to require reporting of adverse events. So again, there are major gaps in the, in the gathering and the reporting of this data. And then finally, from our perspective, most importantly, getting it out to the public. So we're in the midst, of course, all of us, um, of a sea change in our healthcare system in California and nationally, trying to ensure people get the right care at the right time, that the care is safe and high quality, and care that they can afford. The public needs the evidence on how outpatient surgery settings are performing. Public should be able to rely on consistent, high quality oversight across the board at outpatient facilities, no matter what agency or department is charged with overseeing them. And we should have a very clear way to find out how to file a complaint if we have one. We should just ha also have access to readily comparable safety data, regardless, again, of who has jurisdiction. And policymakers as well need that information to craft solutions that ensure and improve on healthcare quality and safety as they struggle to make care affordable for consumers and to contain health system costs. So thank you very much for coming and I look forward to the other presentations and the conversation. Thank you.
Um, over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be giving you a very high-level overview of the contents of the large um, uh, paper that's in your packet. Um, let's see. The, the, this project really emanated from California Healthcare Foundation's long-standing interest in the quality of care and transparency related to outpatient surgery. And two years ago, there was um, an issue brief on that topic. So based on that issue brief, we want to take a deeper dive and find out what do we know about the oversight, transparency, and quality of outpatient surgery settings? How does California compare to other states? And what are opportunities for optimizing care and increasing the transparency in these settings? Outpatient settings are defined in current law based on the level of anesthesia required to perform the procedure. If you need general or deep anesthesia, if you need moderate or conscious sedation, you have to provide, perform those procedures in specified settings. Um, and these settings are regulated by the Department of Public Health, uh, the Medical Board, uh, and the Dental Board of California does not regulate settings, but they do issue permits to dentists depending on the level of anesthesia administered. Uh, the Board of Podiatric Medicine um, has oversight of the individual practitioners, but they do not uh, regulate the facilities. The Department of Public Health, I had some notes with some numbers for you, so I'm going to wing it a little bit here. But the, uh, the detailed numbers of the number of facilities per category is in your report. Um, Department of Public Health has oversight responsibility for surgical clinics. There are 34 in the state, four of which are also certified as ambulatory surgery centers. Ambulatory surgery centers are outpatient settings that seek federal Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement. And there are 740 of those, uh, again, uh, 30 of which are also licensed surgical clinics. Uh, then there are hospital-based outpatient surgery settings. And there are also other clinics, such as primary care, rural health, federally qualified health uh, centers that may be performing procedures that require these sorts of levels of anesthesia. I should note that we don't know the precise number of hospitals that have a, out, that are licensed to provide outpatient surgery uh, in their facilities, but um, according to OSHPED, um, of the over 400 hospitals, there are over 200 that identify themselves as having dedicated outpatient surgery settings or services, um, but uh, nearly 400 of the hospitals um, have done, report some outpatient surgery procedures, probably done in their regular OR rather than in a dedicated outpatient surgery setting. The medical board has responsibility for accredited outpatient settings that are not required to be licensed or certified as another type of setting. Um, but I just there are over 900 outpatient settings regulated by the medical board at this point in time, I believe. Um, and uh, not all accredited settings under the medical board are owned by physicians. Some are owned by dentists, podiatrists, or others who might qualify for the accreditation standards. Except for the Board of Pharmacy, the medical board is the only professional licensing board in California with responsibility for regulating settings. I should also note that there are some outpatient settings accredited under the medical board that may also be certified for Medicare under CDPH. So bear with me, this gets the, the flow chart or the diagram of who does what can get a little bit spider webish, um, and it's a, hopefully a little clearer in the report. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the Diddle Board does not regulate outpatient settings, but they do issue various levels of anesthesia permits depending on the level. Interestingly enough, though, the Medical Board does have the authority to conduct on-site inspections of the offices in which the dentists administer the anesthesia as a part of looking at 
um, their requirements for their anesthesia permits, but these on-site inspections are not done on a routine or periodic basis, and not all settings may receive an inspection. But I did want to note that, that um, authority. The Board of Podiatric Medicine does not uh, regulate outpatient settings. They do regulate the profession. Uh, podiatrists can order any level of anesthesia. They can only administer moderate or conscious sedation, and they can only perform ankle surgery in designated settings, hospitals, ASCs, settings regulated by the medical board, et cetera. Now you're going to have to, uh, uh, I'm going to apologize for this slide a little bit. This gets a little bit into the weeds, but I think you'll understand why it's important. Uh, the type of setting and who regulates it depends on ownership and interest in Medicare Medicaid certification. First of all, licensing versus certification. Licensing is basically um, uh, approval to do business. You can have a professional license as a physician, a podiatrist, a dentist, or you can have a license at, to operate a facility. So license is permission to do business. Certification is so that you meet the standards that CMS has set for being eligible to get Medicare Medi-Cal certification. Then there's a subgroup that we want to, I'm calling deemed versus non-deemed. There are two ways to get Medicare certification. One is through a survey conducted by CDPH, although um, you have to get an exception from CMS to have, become certified in that way. Or you can become accredited through an approved accreditation organization uh, approved by CMS and um, request CMS deem status. That means even though the accreditation agency does the survey, it's been deemed to meet the federal Medicare conditions of participation and, and CDPH does not do those surveys unless there's a complaint. Then accredited versus non-accredited. I'm going to use these terms in conjunction with the medical board. I think it's easier that way. Um, there are, um, of course, if you're an outpatient setting under the authority of the medical board, you have to be accredited by one of the five accreditation agencies. However, uh, non-accredited is kind of the same as non-deemed. If, if you're an ambulatory surgery center um, and get Medicare reimbursement and you're not accredited through an accreditation, accreditation organization, then you are a non-accredited facility. And I do apologize for that slide. It's pretty complicated. Anyway, just want to step back a little bit and talk about historically. There have been some very significant changes in the way that outpatient settings have been regulated in California. Um, historically, um, California law has exempted uh, surgery clinic licensure for those settings that were owned by physicians. And there was no question about that. However, long-standing interpretation by CDPH uh, required uh, settings that were partially owned by physicians or settings in which non-physician owners were allowed to practice. I think the interpretation by CDPH was that obviously uh, outpatient surgeries being done in a physician's own office are exempt from licensure as a, cl a surgery clinic. Well, that was challenged in court uh, around 2005, and um, the historical position that CDPH took was challenged. In 2007, the court ruled against CDPH that CDPH did not have the authority to require these settings to be licensed for any level of physician ownership. So the, what that meant was approximately 400 physician-owned clinics that had previously been licensed under CDPH were then uh, forced to um, become uh, under the, uh, the authority of the medical board. Because again, you can't do these procedures unless you're one of uh, a group of listed um, settings that are listed in, in, in the statute. In addition, these um, clinics were no longer required to report, report patient encounter or cost or utilization data to um, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. 
And we all know the importance of the OSHPED data in terms of understanding the scope of the healthcare delivery that's being um, provided in California, the costs, the types of procedures, the patient outcomes, um, and the, even the availability. Uh, if you have an outpatient setting that's uh, doing bariat specializing in bariatric types of surgery versus other types of surgery, you want to know for access to care um, to determine if there's adequate access to care in certain counties for different types of um, surgical procedures. At about the same, well, a little bit later, actually, in 2008, um, there, there was quite a bit of news that broke about a cluster of hepatitis C virus infections that were traced back to two Nevada ambulatory surgery centers. As a result, 100 patients actually developed hep C from these ASCs because of the way they were, uh, their failure to um, follow appropriate infection control um, practices. As a result, CMS um, piloted a more stringent and a lengthier survey process that really focused on infection control and other quality measures. Uh, as a result, the federal certification survey protocols were, were changed and were implemented in 2010. Regarding uh, oversight, I think it's important to note that there are different standards for the same types of procedures. Any one of these settings, whether it's hospital, ASC, surgical clinic, or an outpatient setting under the medical board, or uh, a rural health clinic, uh, can be doing the uh, same types of procedures, but there are different set of standards for each setting. There are licensing standards for some settings, there are certification standards for non-deemed ASCs that are done by a Department of Public Health. There's certification for ASCs that are done by accreditation standard, and each of the approved accreditation organizations has their own standards, which must be the, be the equivalent of the federal standards. There's accreditation under the Medical Board of California, who has five approved accredited organizations right now, each of whom has their own standards, but must meet certain minimum threshold standards. So that does give rise to some questions of oversight by different state entities and differing standards. Um, it was beyond the scope of this report to really make, uh, draw any conclusions or compare what those standards are. Um, but we wanted to note that, that very important question. Then I wanted to get into quality of care and what do we know. First of all, many professional associations or collaboratives promote benchmarking and quality indicators. They publish best practices and research. Um, and the oversight entities, whether it is state licensing or an accreditation body, have their own quality assurance requirements built into um, their processes. Um, and then, of course, transparency, the information on quality of care can certainly be an improvement for, uh, catalyst for improvement. Um, speaking of accreditation organizations, the um, AAASF is the only accreditation organization that requires uh, their entities to report um, benchmarking or quality data on a, on a quarterly basis and they actually do provide a feedback loop, and so they do know the types of um, quality issues um, so that those settings can, can improve. Uh, then finally, um, I, I should have gone back to the other slide. Uh, first of all, compliance with minimum standards is one way to gauge um, quality of care because these standards have been established as a minimum threshold that any sort of setting must meet to provide quality of care. Then transparency under Department of Public Health. Um, there is no listing of outpatient surgery settings posted at the current time. Uh, I do know that additional information has been uh, published on CDPH's website um, right after the first of the year, um, and so perhaps um, additional information on additional settings will be forthcoming. Uh, state licensing and non-deemed certification surveys and complaints of ASCs and hospitals are public information. Um, hospital uh, 
surveys and complaints are starting to be posted on the website. But at the time of the publication, um, there were no copies of the actual survey reports. So if you wanted to uh, go online, first of all, there's not a list for you to go to of outpatient surgery settings, and neither can you pull up a copy of the report and look at it. However, if CDPH conducts the survey or complaint investigation, that information is public. You can submit a Public Records Act request and get a copy of the findings. But uh, again, that, uh, it's uh, something that um, should certainly be online. Uh, but surveys of ambulatory surgery centers or hospitals that have deemed status, that is, they're done by accrediting bodies uh, for certification purposes, are not public and neither are they provided to CDPH. Only a few states require accreditation organizations to provide the certification surveys, Medicare certification surveys, to the state agency. So, in other words, there are, let's see, three to 400 ambulatory surgery centers where the, the surveys and complaint investigations report are not public, period, and they're not available to the regular uh, CDPH. Um, complaints against ASCs and hospitals with deemed status. Um, if, the, if CDPH winds up doing a special survey, those are public, but the ones done by the accrediting body, bodies are not um, public information. And again, adverse events for hospitals, which may include hospital outpatient settings, are public, but they're not posted at the current time. The Medical Board of California, the over 900 um, uh, outpatient settings under the Medical Board, uh, the accreditation surveys are public and posted online. Uh, the corrective action plans are public and posted online. The type of specialty is posted online, which is very interesting. Um, the medical board has a very uh, detailed uh, way of categorizing the types of procedures that are done uh, in each of the settings. The accreditation status is posted online. For instance, if they're on probation or they've had it, uh, their accreditation revoked or, or um, that, that information is available. However, complaints filed against these settings are not considered public information and they're not posted online. Um, the accrediting organizations will investigate and if there's any indication that an individual physician is somehow um, involved in the complaint, then the medical board has the authority to investigate the individual under their uh, physician license. Uh, outpatient settings under the medical board are required to um, report adverse events. Um, but unlike CDPH, the medical board does not have the authority to make these public or to post them online. Then uh, just, the, again, limited information about quality. The medical board makes copies of, I should say, most of their surveys available. Their complaint investigation reports are not available or adverse events. Um, other surveyors are considered public information but are not available online and there's no data to, uh, to, uh, about overall compliance to compare with other settings. As Bessley alluded, a, a type of procedure can be done in any one of these settings, but we have no data to compare the quality of care or the information across settings. Very quickly, um, I just wanted to note uh, that CDPH issues, a, these are for only ambulatory surgery centers that are under the authority of CDPH, the ones that are not deemed. Um, CDPH issues a higher number of deficiencies per survey than the national average. And I wanted to show you this uh, in terms of compliance data. These are the, the number of, total number of federal deficiencies issued for all categories. You'll note the spike in 2010 that probably corresponds to the uh, more intensive federal certification standards and survey protocol that happened in 2010. Um, I would note too that uh, it's difficult to compare standards and to make judgments uh, to here today on the settings. 
Um, but I will note that um, CDPH, in addition to physicians and nurse surveyors, has access to pharmacists, dietitians, infection control practitioners, and medical records consultants, um, which um, accrediting organizations may not. Uh, the most frequently cited types of deficiencies, I'm not going to read them off to you. And so what does this mean in terms of the worst of the worst of the worst? Um, out of the 740 um, ambulatory surgery centers certified, uh, most of whom are under um, the authority of CDPH, there were 16 ASCs that actually had their Medicare termination certified for health and safety reasons between 2011 and 2013. I found this to be very interesting. Um, the um, accreditation surveys conducted of the over 900 uh, settings under the medical board, 66% of those surveys were deficiency free. That is the accrediting organization found no deficiencies at all. The 6%, the non-deemed ASCs under CDPH, that means these are the entities that want Medicare but they didn't get certified through an accreditation organization. 6% of those facilities, those 400 some odd facilities, um, were deficiency free. So 94% had deficiencies. Then deemed ASCs, what, what happens is if, a, if an ASC is deemed and they get their certification through a federal accreditation organization, CMS requires CDPH to go in and do a sample survey to see how these, these um, uh, settings are doing, or they may ask CDPH to go in on a complaint investigation related to a ASC with deemed status. When CDPH goes in to the deemed status ASCs, 20% of those um, admittedly small sample are deficiency free. We looked at the other states' regula regulations, statutes, what's available online, um, and some of their public reporting requirements. Uh, again, just the highlights here. Uh, medical Board is one of 13 state medical boards that regulate settings. A medical Board is the only state board that posts their accreditation surveys online. CDPH is the only state survey agency that does not post a list of outpatient surgeries online. And I wanted to note here that even though most dental boards do not regulate the settings, they just issue the permits to the dentist, they do require dentists to report adverse events. I could not find any information or evidence um, that uh, California dentists are required to report adverse events. I also want to note that of the 740 ASCs that are certified and under CMS CDPH, they are not required to report adverse events unless they are also accredited under the medical board. So that's a huge number of settings that does not have to report adverse events. Uh, I'll just note here that uh, some settings are required to report adverse events, infection rates, or other measures of quality. Um, the settings uh, regulated by the medical board report adverse events but not infection rates. Hospitals have to report infection rates and adverse events. And uh, ASCs and hospitals, uh, or ASCs clinics and dental offices that are not also reported by the medical board do not report adverse events. Now in the report there are 16 opportunities identified. These are just a few. Uh, first of all, I, I think one of the, uh, an opportunity is just provide a listing of all settings online. Make it easy for consumers to find uh, the, 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 the settings in which they're getting care. Then provide all copies of all licensing, certification, and accreditation surveys and investigation reports online for all settings. Require all settings to report data to OSHPED. Uh, it's a large segment of the healthcare delivery system that we have very, we, uh, there's a huge gap in the data that we have. Uh, require all settings to report adverse events, including dental offices, and then require the medical board to provide post information reports on complaints and adverse events filed against settings. Thank you.
So that was obviously a lot of information, um, and I think the um, <laughs> difficulty in tracking and following the many, many, many different kinds of settings and the different regulation is kind of proof of the problem that we're trying to describe today. Um, but I'd like to invite um, two perspectives on what you've heard and potentially different solutions um, that we might want to advance in, in solving this problem. Um, so I think we'll have Bryce, uh, who's representing the California so uh, Ambulatory Surgery Association, go first, and then we'll have Yvonne from the CMA perspective. And you can do it t either one, your choice. We'll do it from here, if everybody can hear me okay. Hope uh, everybody is clear on exactly what Brenda was talking about. She is what we would call scary smart on this topic. Um, there will be a test at the end of the uh, briefing. Um, first, first off, I, my name is Bryce Doherty. Um, like Mary Beth said, I, I lead the healthcare advocacy practice at KP Public Affairs. I've actually had the pleasure of representing the California Ambulatory Surgery Association for 10 years. Um, and have learned a lot more, way more about outpatient surgery than I ever thought I would. So um, it's, an, it's a growing field um, in, in the healthcare space. It's maybe a relatively newer sort of environment where people would get care. Um, so we've, we've worked for many, many years to try and refine a lot of the things that Brenda mentions in her report. I, I do want to commend um, at the outset both the California Healthcare Foundation um, Ms. Shuri, Mary Beth, and Brenda and her team, um, it, it's a Herculean task to really uh, take a very critical look at the way in which uh, outpatient surgery centers are regulated. The, the study was originally supposed to be just a California specific study. Uh, Bre Brenda quickly expanded that study to all 50 state analysis. Um, it's taken two years. Uh, the California Ambulatory Surgery Association has been involved from the get-go, trying to not only point Brenda and, and her team, but, but others to where a lot of the information is and where you can find resources on many of the things that they, they talked about in the report. Um, we're proud to be acknowledged in the report um, as, as being a resource throughout this process. Um, but clearly, it's complex, right? It's very, very, very complex. Um, Web-like is a word. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult for a consumer uh, to move through the morass if, if you really took the time and energy to try and figure out um, what metrics are available out there for you to, to empower your decision making. I think the report, uh, not to put too fine of a point on it, I think the report uh, is excellent. You know, I, we see the report broken down into kind of four seg three segments. One is the regulatory oversight component. Um, there are three regula regulatory entities that regulate ASCs in California, Brenda walked through, but um, we've, we've worked for many, many years to try and streamline uh, those sorts of regulatory oversight deficiencies. I think the other piece that's mentioned in the report that that's shouldn't be missed is communication. Brenda talks a lot about um, communication not only between the Department of Public Health and the Medical Board, but the medical board and the podiatric medical board, the dental board of California, that, you know, there are not just one type of, of surgery or procedure that's, that's uh, performed in these facilities. So I think that, uh, we think that has a lot of merit. Um, I can tell you from experience over about a year or so ago, uh, the medical board of California, since they are now our adoptive home for a majority of the uh, facilities, the outpatient surgery center facilities in the state, you know, they tried for a year to get an interagency agreement between the Department of Public Health and the Medical Board for purposes of the Department of Public Health sharing the adverse event reports that they were obligated to get from the facilities. Unfortunately, they couldn't come to an agreement on that arrangement. Um, we had to work on legislation during the Medical Board's sunset review process to take that reporting obligation away from the Department of Public Health and put it under the Medical Board. Um, so I think this issue of communication among the regulatory agencies is really mission critical. And, and the third piece, quite frankly, is uh, data and transparency. Um, I, I could tell you that the, the California Ambulatory Surgery Association, that's commonly referred to as, as CASA, um, has spent many years trying to come up with a clear, concise policy on transparency. We've got a transparency statement. 
that basically um, speaks to empowering the consumer to have all ready available information and data as it pertains to the quality of care, the cost of that care, um, and that's not just for ambulatory surgery centers. We think that needs to include all spectrums of the healthcare space. It should be hospital costs, it should be uh, quality metrics across all uh, facility type settings. So we think there's, there's a lot of merit there in terms of getting the right information um, and getting that uh, in an in a actionable format that is really shoppable for the consumer. Um, unfortunately, this, this issue is mentioned in the report and, these, and, and what Brenda talked about today is not new. Uh, we being uh, CASA has, have been working on this issue for about 10 years, um, dating back to when Brenda was uh, one of the deputy directors at the now Department of Public Health in the Licensing and Certification Division. So um, it's not new. And, and quite frankly, I, I think uh, CASA, um, which represents about you know, over 300 of these facilities in the state, and they range from very small, single specialty, maybe ophthalmology or GI facilities, all the way to very large four, maybe eight OR room, multi-specialty ambulatory surgery centers that function, quite frankly, oftentimes like a, like a hospital sort of setting. But dating back to 2006, um, we sponsored legislation that would have required the Department, to convene a, the Department of Public Health to convene a work group to look at issues around a clear, consistent licensure criteria. Up until 2013, there was no clear concise licensure criteria that the Department of Public Health was supposed to use. Um, we sponsored that legislation that was vetoed by then uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. Following year, 2007, we, we also sponsored similar legislation that would have actually gone in and established the licensure requirements for ASCs within the Department of Public Health. Um, we sponsored that legislation. That legislation was vetoed by Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, 2008, we, we ran up the hill again um, and tried to figure out a way in which we can provide clear, concise oversight for a lot of these facilities. I think at that point, the Department of Public Health was, was getting smart to what we were up to, and uh, due to cost that, that would have been laden on the Department of Public Health, that bill unfortunately died in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Um, 2009, we, we kind of started learning our lessons. So around 2009, we sat down with the Department of Public Health and we said, listen, what's the What's the problem with providing clear, concise oversight for these facilities? Why is, why are you, you know, is there recommendations being made not, not to move forward? And one thing the department really wanted was mandatory state licensure of ambulatory surgery centers. Um, that's important because if you're an acute care hospital in California, you're mandated to be state licensed. You must be state licensed. Um, so understanding where the department was coming from uh, we, along with the department, went to then chair the Assembly Health Committee, now Insurance Commissioner Dave Jones, and convinced him to author legislation that was sponsored by the department um, to require uh, ASCs to be mandatorily licensed by the Department of Public Health. CASA was the only organization that supported that bill. Consumers Union wasn't there, nobody else was there. We were the only ones that were supporting that legislation. And you know, I've been doing this for a very long time and I'm just surprised that there is an industry that's represented by an association that has been clamoring for 10 years to be regulated by the state legislature. Um, unfortunately, that bill um, didn't get a hearing because there was overwhelming opposition to what that looks like, what does that mean. So it isn't anything new. Um, fast forward to, th to this year. We, along with the Medical Board of California, are sponsoring legislation this legislative session. It's SB 396 by Senator Hill. Senator Hill is chair of the Senate Business and Professions Committee, the committee that oversees the Medical Board, and by default, since we are now under the oversight of the Medical Board, now has a jurisdiction over regulating 99.9% you know, .9 of the, the uh, surgery centers in the state. Um, that bill does many, many things. One of the things the bill would have done, which was a recommendation of the medical board, was to require all outpatient settings, whether you're certified, accredited, or state licensed, to report their data to OSHPED. Um, we were not able to uh, keep that provision in the bill due to the complexity of the issue. Even though the policy's right, um, even though it makes sense to a lot of people, when we cross the street 
and we engage in the legislative process, everything is, is shrouded in politics. So again, I would say we, we agree with many, many things that are in the report. Um, we uh, as an organization have been the ones leading the charge for the past 10 years to try and get many of these things done. Um, we like to think of ourselves as patient advocates as well. And um, to that end, we're going to stay committed to the issue and, and our, couldn't have a crystal ball to see what happens with regards to the report, but we're certainly glad it's out there and that uh, the foundation is committed to the work and, and Brenda did an excellent job. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Yvonne Chung. I am the Senior Director with the California Medical Association and our Center for Medical and Regulatory Policy. Um, first of all, I wanted to echo Bryce's comments. We want to thank CHCF and Brenda Klutz for their work in compiling the data found in this report. It is very, very confusing. It is a lot of information to digest, even for those of us who have been working in this area for a number of years. <coughs> Excuse me. First off, I just want to say that CMA, of course, we support oversight, appropriate oversight for all outpatient surgery settings in order to ensure that safe and high quality medical care is being provided to all patients. I don't think there's any disagreement among anybody. What everybody wants at the end of the day is for patients to have safe care. Um, however, uh, this issue is very complicated, as um, Brenda mentioned in her report, and I just wanted to raise a couple of issues to kind of flesh out some of these ideas. Um, given the variety of surgical procedures and the settings in which they can be and are being performed, uh, it may be overly simplistic to set a single standard that must be met by everyone ranging from you know, a, a single physician practicing in, a, in an office um, doing more, you know, some more minor types of surgery all the way up to uh, more complicated surgery, ambulatory surgery centers. So I think we need to keep that in mind. I think it can be very attractive to just say, let's set a standard and make sure everybody meets it, period. Um, and as Brenda alluded, it's, it's much more complicated than that. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about the outpatient surgery centers that are regulated by the Medical Board of California. Obviously, that's where a lot of our members are practicing. Um, the report presents three types of oversight, certification, licensing, and accreditation. Um, the settings regulated by the medical board are all required to be accredited by recognized entities. And I think it's important for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of accreditation, that accreditation doesn't mean it's a lower standard. In many cases, accreditation is actually a much higher standard. There's more flexibility to add new standards. Um, as things in the industry change, as we know, you know, new devices are coming out all the time, new procedures are being developed. Um, this is not a static field. So uh, most, if not all, accreditation organizations, they are required to meet minimum standards, um, similar to what is required for licensing, but um, a lot of what they do goes far beyond what is required um, for minimum standards. And just to give you some example, um, the Institute for Medical Quality, which does a lot of this work, and in full disclosure is a subsidiary of CMA, um, 36 of their, stand, of their 168 standards are driven by compliance with regulation. Everything else is driven by industry standards, best practices, what they learn by going out in the field. And I think it's important to recognize that when you do accreditation, you're always raising the, you're raising the bar all the time. So it's not as if you meet accreditation standards one year and you're good for perpetuity. They're going to keep changing that. They're going to keep raising the bar so that everybody, so the minimum, the, the surgery center that previously met the minimum requirement, they have to keep getting bumped up. So they are always looking at quality improvement, which is a much different model than licensing where you're just, you know, you have a checklist of things that you have to meet and that's it. And they'll come back and see you in three years. Um, Another issue I want to talk about was data and patient safety. Um, I think it's, it, you can always do more with more data. Uh, we would agree. Um, I think looking at some of the opportunities, having all the surgery centers listed in one place would be enormously helpful. I think we would find that to be enormously helpful as well, not having to figure out for the patient, not having the patient have to worry about figuring out who regulates the surgery center where they're going to be having a procedure. Um, however, I think we have to be smart about our data collection. It's not free, it's not easy, it all requires resources, so we have to think about our priorities. What is the problem that we're trying to address? Um, you know, we don't, we have, because we weren't collecting data 40 years ago, we actually don't know whether or not patient safety in outpatient surgery centers has increased over the last 10 years overall. Um, it's hard to say. I would say it probably has. I think things have gotten better. We've gotten better about oversight. Um, 
I think we also want to think about, um, you know, when we look at data, what the context that that data is being presented. Providing raw numbers of deficiencies is interesting, but again, what does it really tell us about um, how safe the patient actually is going to be? Um, you've got to put, take it into the context of the type of procedures that are being performed in that facility, the resources available in that community. So there's a lot of factors that come into play here rather, that is more than just collecting more data. I think we want to collect smarter data. Um, and finally, on the issue of adverse events and complaints, um, I think we understand the, the concern from the consumer side of wanting to know if somebody has complained about um, a surgery center. However, I think uh, on the issue of complaints, what's important to note is that the current standard for posting complaints, and the medical board does this for individual physicians as well, is that complaints have to be verified, because really anybody can submit a complaint. And what we want to make sure is that the complaints that are received, and if they are, you know, they're, the medical board only posts when um, the complaint has been investigated and there's an accusation being made and basically that it's been verified and substantiated. So we don't believe that there's a lot of value in just posting um, every complaint that comes in. This isn't Yelp. Um, and on the issue of adverse um, events, I think the same thing holds true. In our discussions with CDPH on how they how they publicize information about adverse events with regard to hospitals, what they tell us is that hospitals sometimes report adverse events and CDPH goes in and investigates and they say sometimes that it wasn't even an adverse event. There's a misunderstanding about what needs to be reported. So again, I think it's just not so much not making this information available, but we want to make sure that whatever is posted and shared with the public is, is verified and substantiated. Uh, but again, thank you to CHCF. I think this report provides a lot of data. Uh, and information and food for thought um, as we move forward on this complicated issue. Thank you. So our panelists would be happy to take questions now. Um, let me just reiterate one point. We do know there is a piece of active legislation. CHCF does not take positions on legislation. Um, so I, but I'm happy to entertain any questions from our audience. Yes, in the back. Thank you, Katie. We do have microphones coming around. If you could introduce yourself, please. Hi, Patrick Ma, Health Access. Um, so my question is that, does ASC keep all the data regarding medical errors and infection rates, even though the OSPET doesn't require you to submit them? Or does it just because OSPET doesn't require you don't even collect them at all? So Yvonne, is that question is that question clear to you? So you're, are you asking you're asking if the individual surgery centers maintain this yes. data? Right. Um, I think that they probably maintain it in different ways. A lot of this data, you know, again, we have to get into the discussion about what constitutes a medical error. Um, I don't know. I think every ASC probably has a different system um, for filing this kind of data waste. For a small surgery center, it may just be embedded in the patient record. Um, for larger uh, surgery settings, they may have a more formalized process for collecting this kind of data. I think it's going to vary quite a bit based on the resources available. At the so, yeah, yeah, Bryce, okay. from the perspective of the center. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a quality expert, but let me give you, let me give you two perspectives. We, we had, I mean, we had a very difficult time with some of our, the smartest people in the room trying to find this information on hospitals. Um, you can find some of it. What you have to do is you have to go to the CDPH website. You have to then click on health information. You then have to click on the health facility consumer information tab. You then have to click on public inquiry reports. You then have to click on my hospital infections. And you, try, you have to try and make sense of what that information means. <laughs> uh, it's probably not shoppable information to the consumer. The other thing that I think is really important is when we're, we're talking about <coughs> adverse events or particularly when we're talking about infection rates in hospitals, how many, how many uh, uh, procedures are hospitals required to report with regards to infection rates? Anybody have an idea of all the procedures that a hospital does? 23. Okay, so, so Medicare and others only are requiring a hospital to report very specific procedures with regards to that infection rate. And that doesn't really translate to the ASC environment because only 1% of those procedures are actually done in the ASC. I would suggest if I was a consumer how do I get information about my ASC? I would tell them three, I would tell them a couple things. One, go to that facility, call that facility, ask if they are either accredited by the medical board, Medicare certified, or licensed by the Department of Public Health. They have to be one of the three. Second thing I would do is I would tell the consumer to go to the medical board's website. 
If you want information on an ASC and what sort of deficiencies they have or corrective action plans the, the accreditation agency has asked for, um, that'll be on the medical board's website. That's two clicks. That's nbc.ca.gov. Then you click on outpatient surgery center. You click on, you know, you, you keyword the facility. You're going to get information around the accreditation report the accredit accreditation agency did, the date that report was done, if there, were, if there have been any deficiencies that the accreditation agency or the medical board has forwarded with regards to that facility, you're going to find the corrective action plan the, the accredit accrediting agency is required. You're going to see the outcome, whether or not those requirements were met, and then you're going to be able to, to visibly see in PDF form the actual outcome report. So we're getting there. We're just, it's difficult to find the information even if you're in it. Yeah, Betsy has a comment as well. Yeah, ju just to add to that, actually, Bryce, I, I agree that the Medical Board of California has done a lot to improve their website, and, and that access to accreditation information is great and, and uh, stands out. So that's terrific. But the bottom line uh, to your question is you cannot find the infection and the adverse event information. Um, if they're collecting it, um, as Yvonne said, they're collecting it in different ways. And really, the bottom line is we do not have that information, and the public ought to have it. Additional question up here in the front. I'm Christina Jewett. I'm a journalist with the Center for Investigative Reporting. I seem to remember when, I think it was the Roderick Wright legislation that passed, was at SB 100 a few years ago. Wasn't one of the issues at that time that they wanted to be more transparency with the name of the actual physicians and the owners of the facilities? And I was just wondering if, if that's the correct recollection and if that's still being kept up to date, because I was actually looking on the website a few days ago for someone I know to own an ASC and I couldn't find their you know, I searched the name and nothing came up. So I'm just wondering if anyone took a look at that or, or what the status was. Do I don't know, Bryce, are you more familiar with I, 100? Surprise, I have an opinion. Um, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was SB 100. It was from uh, 2011. It was Kern Price who authored the bill. He was chair of the Senate BNP committee. And, you know, not to, not to get into too much detail, but that was kind of a watershed piece of legislation because it really gave the medical board true oversight and, and somewhat control and transparency between the accrediting bodies and, and the medical board. Um, I think what you find online is really a result of that and that's getting better and better and better by the day and by the month. The medical board is only required to post information with regards to accredited facilities. So if you happen to be just Medicare certified, um, that facility is regulated by CMS and the Department of Public Health is the contracting agency for CMS with regards to those facilities. The Department of Public Health is also the regulator of jurisdiction if you happen to be state licensed. So it gets a little bit complicated but we would completely concur with, with um, Brenda's findings that you know information on the Department of Public Health's website with regards to a licensed or Medicare certified facility is um, disappointing to say the least. Hi, I'm Helen Wu with UC Davis. Uh, Brenda and I spoke on the phone a little while ago, so you probably know the question that might be coming. And thank you all the panelists for your comments, and thank you so much for the report and all the hard work you've done on this, um, Brenda. Uh, so, so we're working on a report for CDPH in response to SB 534 to examine whether uh, broader regulatory standards are needed to license ASCs, as well as a couple of other healthcare settings. So kind of looking at a different question of whether the current standards, uh, which are essentially the federal standards, are adequate. So I'm wondering, you know, when we see these quality and safety concerns that arise in, in, the, in the news reports, you know, in the media, is it, in your opinion, more because of the regulatory patchwork being inadequate and kind of gaps in that, or are there additional opportunities for more extensive regulation that you've seen from all of your work and looking at quality issues? Thank you. I think some of it can certainly be attributed to the regulatory patchwork. Um, but what you're talking about, the uh, legislation, um, Prior to, I think, 2014, the department had no licensing standards for surgery clinics. Um, by practice, they had used the federal certification standards, and they sponsored legislation 
to be able to get permission or authority to use the federal ASC requirements as a state licensing. And, and I know that UC Davis is looking at recommendations on whether or not that is the way to go or there are other approaches to um, uh, quality. I, I think having um, the same standards for surgery clinics as for ASCs is good. That kind of reduce, reduced one of the uh, gaps, if you will. Um, so that if you want to do these sorts of procedures, you know that there is this single set of standards that surgery centers and ASCs must meet. Those are different than the standards that the um, outpatient settings and the medical boards must meet. Um, so again, I think it certainly reduced the the, the, some of the fragmentation, but um, we really didn't look at the outcome in terms of quality of care for this report. We didn't dig, that, that would require a much deeper dive in terms of the implications of each of those uh, uh, types of standards. Because each of the five accrediting bodies have their own standards. The ones for the medical board are different than the ones for deemed status for ASCs. So um, we, we did, that was outside the scope of the report. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for sticking with us on a really kind of complicated thank topic. Um, I would encourage you to read the um, report. There's both an issue brief and then the fuller report. And if you have any questions or comments, the California Healthcare Foundation would love to hear them. So thanks very much for participating.